The following video contains spoilers. We suggest watching the episodes alone in the dark. Hey, 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 Wolfpack! How's my favorite audience? It's summertime, and while some kids love catching all them monsters on their Pokemon, cool kids hunt down monsters to kill them. Including today's sweet summer children on tonight's Goosebumps tale, How to Kill a Monster. No, this isn't the cheat code for Mewtwo. We re-enter the traditional creature feature horror story on everyone's favorite R.L. Stein classic, Goosebumps. However, if you can believe it or not, I rarely hear anyone discuss this episode. Not even as a bad tale or a good tale. Which shocks me, because I sincerely think How to Kill a Monster is an awesome episode. We got him now! Yeah, for reals. In spite of my catitude, this was a plot I always found super fun and incredibly scary as a little kitten. Maybe not dethroning the haunted mask scary, but quite gripping, eerie, and terrifying from my young mindset. I never had any huge criticisms towards the plot, and do recall it being good, but things can change for us as we grow up. So we'll have to see the full picture again to see if my love for it remains. <laughs> Oh. Though, as I said, I barely hear Goose fans talk about this one. The harshest thing I've heard regarding the Swamp Monster Summer is that some find it simply okay, or nothing too special. Yet, there are clearly many loving fans, since this was another big pick on my big-ass request pile. So, some do agree with me that it's still a hidden spooky spectacle. Stein brings us back to his typical monster story style, where some sassy adventurous kids must combat a big scary demonic ghoul in a haunted house, if they wish to survive. Nothing too deep, but general fun and epic suspense in a cool setting. Luckily, the showrunners actually improve upon a lot of the dazzling concepts and nifty ideas from the novel, in order to make How to Kill a Monster vastly greater. This is another Goosebumps adaptation which alters a ton of details and changes things around, yet does so in a way for the story's benefit, as any good adaptation would. So don't fret, book fans. It is different in a few areas, but this episode is totally loyal to the spirit of the novel and truly evolves it better than ever. Yahoo! However, this is another Stein fable where the plot is simplified so it can focus on its main selling point, the monster. There's a huge debate over whether this spooky monster worked or not, as it suffered the most changes which split book fans and show fans for years, meaning that the monster is the major element which will either make or break this episode for you. Whoever's directing this is a mess! Suspense. Some hated or were let down by the big bad, while others idolize it very much as an underrated icon. Where do I land on this battle? Well, that's what we plan to find out. Our kid heroes are in for one grim summer nightmare, and so are you. Grab your gumbo spoons and pokeballs, cause it's time we head into the grass zone. This is our wacky riff view on the underrated Goosebumps gem, How to Kill a Monster. So, our episode opens up in a spooky swamp. Meanwhile, at the Legion of Doom. Not now! Okay. The swamp, as always, is a gross, eerie setting for Goosebumps, as it's swarmed with unknown horrors, which even unease our main characters, Gretchen and Clark, two bratty step-siblings with polar opposite personas, being sent to spend the summertime at their grandparents' pad, out in the deep south country, while their newlywed parents are off on their honeymoon, forcing this unlikely pair to get along 
stirring some summer semantics. I guess is it. You guess? <laughs> oh, great. My allergies. Already, this is very different from the novella. In the book, the parents were actually with them when dropping off the kids at the Dagobah town. The family gets into numerous fake-outs and setups to establish the plot. The family had also been together for a long while, yet the episode changes it to their family just recently forming, in order to create more tension between the step-siblings getting to know each other for the first time. The parents were also actually summoned on a business trip, but since Stein did that way too many times, it was altered to them off on their honeymoon to add more to the family drama. All the filler is gone, so we can get to the good stuff instantly, and lastly, the stupid dog Charlie was deleted from the episode. Gasp. I never would have guessed. Now, these may seem like a ton of huge changes, but the writers do upgrade the story as a whole, because the episode instead focuses on the horror and grants the kids much deeper depth, because the kid heroes are not that attached yet. So they learn to trust each other throughout the plot and work through their tension. Book Gretchen and Clark were already chill with each other, so the TV version Grant's more intrigued with a bonding trip. Also, we get lots of funny banter between the duo. Gretchen is an outdoorsy country girl, while Clark's a nerdy city boy, leading to some hilarious clashes. I told my mom I didn't want to come here this weekend. What are you gonna do? Go on the honeymoon with them? There wouldn't even be a honeymoon if your dad hadn't begged my mom to marry him. My dad begged. I don't think so, pal. On your mom's idea. I smell a sitcom! The child acting is surprisingly very good in this. In fact, I believe the entire cast is so rad and perfect. But the kids totally steal the show. Gretchen and Clark are mega fun kid heroes to follow. The snarky banter between them is always funny. The actors actually share a solid chemistry and do entertain. And the story adding the subplot where their recent step-siblings who have to learn to get along genuinely makes them interesting and offers some nice character development all throughout. They probably don't earn Carly Beth praise, but they're so unique over the generic average kids no one understands. I truly like the pair, and they make this episode very enjoyable to sit through because of their delightful energy. Weren't your grandparents supposed to pick us up at the airport? Well, they're getting kind of old, you know. My dad says sometimes they forget things. Yeah, like us. They're pretty faithful to their book versions as well, repeating most of their novel moments accurately, but giving them even more traits. The only minor change is that Clark wore glasses in the book, but not in the show. I can only presume it's because the kids do some major stunt work in this horror, so the crew didn't want to risk broken glass. My glasses! I can't see without my glasses! My glasses! I can't be seen without my glasses! We skip over all the lame filler and fluff, with the kids arriving at their grandparents' genuinely eerie haunted mansion. The old timers are country folks who run a gumbo restaurant in their own backyard and live in the Resident Evil 7 plantation. What the hell? Rise and shine, sleepyhead. It's time for supper. And it only gets even scarier on the inside. This is a lovely room of death. I love the spooky setting and atmosphere of this tale, as it feels super unnerving even before the monster shows up. In most of our Goosebumps episodes, we get some basic sets like a normal suburb, gray warehouses, schools, or cheesy sci-fi labs, but this episode delivers the ultra-creepy southern gothic world of the novel superbly. The swamp was already fright disgusting, but the plantation castle is absolutely well designed and makes for an epic haunted house to get lost in. There's dim lighting, dark rooms, a labyrinth of hallways, 
hallways, secret paths, an isolation in a quiet forest, and dead animals all decorating the walls with eyes constantly watching. Much like the bog, the RE7 mansion is just so eerie and mysterious that you're not sure if something is lurking outside or within your own walls. It's super effective, not to mention a worthy level for a monster boss fight. Atmosphere! But that house isn't as cool as I, right, cat? Never house. Of course, the old coots aren't home, so they wander around, where after noticing a secret room, they get a jump scare by Grandma, like RE7, where they welcome the kids in with that southern hospitality. Excuse me, do you know how to get to town? Yeah, it's back the way you came. The grandparents are played decently enough and do act as quirky, if senile, weirdos. Though, the elders are vastly changed from the book. In the novel, Grandma Rose and Grandpa Eddie were straight up too dumb to live and lethally stupid as they were awful at taking care of their grandkids. Screw up, constantly did moronic things, and their stupidity pretty much endangers them all entirely. They were so terrible that some fans theorize that they might have not only been evil, but probably the worst guardians in the franchise next to the chicken chicken artards. They're another contender in Stein's top 10 worst adults ever, and are easily at fault for every bad thing that occurs in the novel. They were on par with the Turner parents. Give us the boy. Fortunately, the episode miraculously fixes them. Not quite perfect elders, but they are miles superior than their novel counterparts. In the show, they actually care about the well-being of the kids, have a strong kinship with Gretchen, funny moments, Grandma is way smarter, Grandpa has legit badass skills as a pro hunter, they spot danger, and instead of seeming evil, they're more so super old and senile so they come across as more goofy and dense thanks to not being too sharp, over-dangerously reckless. Your favorite one? Why does my foot hurt? So yeah, the episode grandparents are improved for the better, but the one thing they do share with their book counterparts is their hidden secrets. After eating some foreshadowing, the fam's all here for some country fun and fear. The acting's pretty decent, as this episode genuinely has some good humor. I guess you two must be pretty happy to be down here and away from that noisy, crowded old city. Oh yeah, I was getting really tired of having a good time. The grandparents being senile also adds more likability because they act ditzy to the point of never remembering Clark's name, yet they do also conceal some hidden wickedness. Did you hear that? What? Will you shut up? You hear me? It's three o'clock in the morning! Old houses usually have bad asthma. The old coots claim it's just the wind, but the kids don't buy it. It's possible, you know, all those creatures out there living in the swamps for centuries, surrounded by slime and weird vapors and stuff, and maybe some new kind of animal evolved, something we haven't seen before, and it's out there right now. From the this is the closest we get to an explanation behind the monster's origin. It's pretty simple, but honestly I like it a lot, since it makes the creature more insane. Basically, the episode teases that the swamp monster is a mutant. It's some type of wild animal that was implied to be horribly mutated by radioactive materials lost in the swamp, growing from a natural predator into a super-powered Hulk-like monster, pissed off and hunting fresh meat. This was blown off as silly, but nowadays with TMNT and creature features doing this stuff all the time, it has honestly held up well as a decent origin to both make the monster far more interesting, but doesn't give too much exposition to rob it of all mystery. It's genuinely a creepy setup, successfully building up towards that looming nightmare. The rising tension 
animation is darn good, as we know the monster is around, yet the kids barely miss it. Gretchen searches for some H2O, only to get another jump scare from Grandpa, where the elders warn her to stay away from the closet. That's just a... a an old storage room full of... Old storage things. What is your fascination with my forbidden closet of mystery? This is all very solid teasing of the monster, especially if this is your first time viewing, as they really gear up when he'll strike. The next day, Gretchen awakens to another jump scare with Clark dressed as a furry. Fun fact, Clark's Halloween costume is actually based on the OG novel monster, as a cute tribute to the book version. The monster got a whole new redesign in this episode, but... That comes later! I I absolutely dig the shout out to the original book version's look, because it's both a neat homage and a solid misdirect for the devout readers, unaware of the Swamp Thing's surprise makeover. Even Goosebumps was a great show which knew how to please its hardcore audience. Steve King wishes he could write like me. The two goof off in a zany chase scene and set up more of the murderous mansion. <laughs> What the heck? Who has stairs to nowhere? What happened to the stairs? My parents took them down because I am grounded. Again, this mansion is so creatively scary, and the set builders totally impressed with memorable designs that make it super distinct as its own haunted house. No lazy prop recycling on this horror saga. While chasing Clark, Gretchen naturally checks out the nightmare room, only finding the monster. <laughs> Sleeping. The step sibs collide into each other, but Clark misses the monster, where they get into even more tomfoolery, only to realize that the actual fools left them home alone. <laughs> Oh. Both the TV and book grandparents have different reasons for leaving the kids. On the page, the grandparents were actually so stupid that they left their younglings behind locked in the house to go get aid to slay the monster, never once thinking that nobody in town is going to believe them when they proclaim a monster's home invading them. <laughs> Yeah, in the book, the monster invades their house and was caged, but on the episode, they accidentally bring it in. On the show, the grandparents actually head into town to collect taxidermy supplies and materials to help them clean up what they believe is a monster corpse, since they don't know that the swamp beast is still alive. Whoa! I think it goes without saying that this was a much smarter change. They established in the episode that Grandpa Eddie is a hunter, and all the dead animal decor are trophies from his swamp kills, with the big scary ghoul being his new win. The grandparents shot and killed the radioactive monster while hunting, and they brought it back home under the impression that it died, in order to add it to their collectibles. This also reveals that the swamp monster is hard to kill, because literally being shot dead can't even even stop it, and it can appear dead when really in a state of unconscious. Really creepy and clever upgrades to the writing, aiding both the plot and the terror. The grandparents leave in this version because they think the monster is dead, but sadly the kids learn it lives the hard way. Sounds like Grandma Rose put a little too much hot sauce in your gumbo. Well, that wasn't my stomach. Wait a second. If you're there, and I'm here, and Istanbul is somewhere in this general area, then who the hell is that? Whoa, I always wondered what it looked like if a Krogan and a Skeksis had a baby together. At long last, we finally meet the monster, our primary source of horror. The Swamp Monster survived its injuries and is now on the loose in the RE7 mansion, pissed off and hunting down the prey that attacked it for food. This is easily one of the scariest scenarios of Goosebumps, and why fans love this 
episode. Two kids who don't get along are trapped in a big scary maze of a home, alone with a savage beast hunting them down at every turn. Where the step sibs must learn to work together and outsmart the hunter in order to survive. It's such a terrifying scenario for both kids and adults because these poor souls are trapped in both this dark house and an isolated swampland with a dangerous beast who wants to eat them where they play a cat and mouse game trying to outmaneuver the other. And that's most of this episode. The kids being stuck inside the death maze dodging a pursuing hunter and figuring out how to kill a monster. What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> A fairly simple plot, but elevated with the sheer terror of kids being forced to hide and do whatever it takes to stop a seemingly unstoppable predator who won't let you out of its sight. I suppose now's a good time to at last talk about the monster. Finally! Some fans either really, really love this creature or absolutely despise it. The naysayers simply hate this thing because it's not book accurate, and sadly downplays the grossness the goon had on the page. I can understand not liking it, since Book Swampy was rad. Fortunately, I freaking love this villain. The Swamp Monster is paws down one of the most underrated, disturbing, and fright-sgusting nightmares to ever walk out of R.L. Stein's demented mind. This is an epic cryptid design, and while not 100% accurate to the book version, it is a wicked looking demon. Remember a long time ago when I complained that the evil thing from the Haunting Hour movie looked like a pale shadow of this monster's appearance? Well, that's because this monster was so magnificent that the Haunting Hour movie tried recapturing its look for the evil thing. Yes, the evil thing's a slight remodified version of this monster, just now black and pregnant. The same choices which ruined Spider-Woman. I never quite loved E.T. though, because the movie kept her so out of focus that you barely saw anything, and couldn't bask in its design at all. I love Erdnot Swamp way more, because he totally shines in the spotlight here in all his glory. And I love what I see. This is a perfect illustration of practical effects bringing horror to life, as the monster still looks bloody amazing by today. In the book, the swamp monster is described as a cross between a gorilla with an alligator's head. He kind of looked like Killer Croc. I believe the showrunners did try to mimic that, but the production limits gave us this instead as a compromise of what they could achieve out of adapting the literature. The Evil Champion looks more like a dinosaur and a chicken hybrid, thanks to its bird-like appendages. But it appears so warped that it successfully adapts the terror it had on the page swimmingly. The demonic hellish skin, the reptile scales, the hunched-over primal stance, a slimy tail, the dirty claws, the cold devil eyes, and heck, even the awkward jerky motions it makes, thanks to the guy in the suit, are are so off-putting. I know some of you keen eye viewers can clearly tell it's a man in a costume, but I think the fact that he jerks his body around and flails his arms so wildly adds a lot of creepiness to what's meant to be a wild animal. Those are practical visuals and smooth details, which help add a sense of real danger to this deranged monster, which something like CGI could never capture. Speaking of nice details, what makes the monster spookier is its primal shriek. In the novel, the discount killer croc actually talked. Stein tries to hint that the monster is secretly intelligent and has it literally speak English, but it's just so silly. Silly, yes. Idiotic, yes. The episode wisely keeps the animal as just that, a primal animal. The TV monster is merely a deadly beast, which maintains that unsettling nature, yet it's not downgraded in the slightest. Killer Croc here always screeches in a primal rage. <laughs> 
Not only is it a grim note, but it sounds like the Xenomorph aliens, which is so cool. That's a tune you'll only hear in your darkest nightmares. So in short, this is an awesome monster, and I cannot believe that this thing did not catch on. I know there's a ton of debate between fans over which form is scarier for him, but there's no denying that this is a truly epic monster, showing off how boss Goosebumps can be. <laughs> While Ernot Croc did get a makeover, the rest of the episode is very loyal to the book's events. The kids cook up schemes to slay the demon, but it's ineffective, and it comes back for more every time. They trick him into following up the ladder to heaven, but the monster got the shoot to hell. <laughs> Welp, that killed him for sure. The kids try to flee, but uh-oh, the old coots locked them in, meaning they have to stay inside or search for some hole in the wall. Through this trial, we get more from the main arc between the step-siblings. While the two are stuck in a Resident Evil mansion with their own personal nemesis, the kids slowly build trust in each other, watch their backs, and peel away layers they never showed prior. This genuinely makes the concept more epic since Book Gretchen and Clark didn't have much persona or depth compared to their TV counterparts. This is the first time the pair are actually together and getting to know each other, so the life and death situation forces them to ally and overcome issues. I really dig that concept since it makes this feel like Drake and Josh in a horror flick. They can't just leave us here. I told my mom not to marry to this family. <laughs> but luckily, they find a note. Yeah, but turn it over. There's a letter. You're right. And they get a message from the grandparents. The note warns them that they had to leave to get supplies to handle the monster and for them to stay put, where they should be safe as long as they avoid the closet. Don't, don't! I don't think Gretchen and Clark get enough credit, as while they do bicker and goof off, they quickly prove that they're real smart kid heroes. We usually see so many idiots in horror stories, including these anthologies, but they are so talented at outsmarting the monster, coming up with schemes, and remain a lot calmer in this position than most of us would be. They really grew on me, since they have so much more charm and better writing to make them clever. So clever that the kids piece it all together what's going on, and how the adults mistook the monster for dead, causing all this misfortune. But while thinking it's chill, the creature returns. <laughs> It becomes very apparent that this monster has horror film powers, so it can't die so easily and gets back to a hunt faster than Jason. While the TV Skeksis isn't as smart as the novel version, which had a playful sadistic streak, this one displays brute strength and a tough refusal to die, which makes it scarier since it's nearly unkillable. There's nothing spookier to a horror fan than a villain who always comes back for one last scare. But these kids don't cry so easily, and literally cook up another plan. The kids try to poison it by using Grandma's baking supplies to make a super hot toxic gumbo to burn Rex's insides. In the book, they baked a pie to poison the Swamp Thing, but the episode changes this to gumbo since, you know, we're in the South, and time is kind of the essence right about now. Not exactly an awful change, since kids got to discover gumbo over Easy Bake Pies. They add all kinds of poisons, hot sauce, Peruvian puff peppers, the works. While the monster grants us more Xeno Shrieks. <laughs> 
there's some masterful suspense here where the Krogan narrowly catches them, but it falls for the trap, and now it dies! <laughs> Welp, that killed him for sure. Gretchen actually wants to be sure it died, but Clark convinces them to cease a chance to run. Where they look for an exit, down in the dark dungeon basement? <laughs> what? Yeah, I have no clue why this mansion has a sex dungeon, or why the heck Grandpa didn't dump the body down here in the cage, but it's a pretty disturbing final level. Unable to escape, the two bicker again, failing to keep their guard up. Ugh, no joke, out of all the creepy stuff in this episode, that brief few seconds of the swamp dino lurking around the corner always stuck with me as the spookiest shot. Reminds me of scary art where evil can hide in plain sight. The monster corners the fools, forcing them to take the high ground, but Clark can't jump. Don't worry though, he tries to save the day by forcing his arm in the monster's mouth. Don't! But miraculous Miraculously, this doesn't disarm him. Instead, he harms Killer Croc. How? Well, we get our big twist. The Swamp Monster is actually allergic to humans and dies from just sampling them. Yep, this beast can't even eat humans because the taste is lethal to it. But the monster never realized its prey were human beings. And the kids were never really an enemy any danger. In the book, this was stupid. I don't like how R.L. Stein made the creature intelligent and able to speak, because if it was smart all along, then how did it not know it was trying to eat humans? The book version of Grunt successfully captures the two, but dies upon licking Gretchen's arm, where it asks if they're human beings, and when they reveal no dur, it quickly chokes to death and falls. Book Monster was Foiled by his own stupidity. Duh! The TV climax totally rectifies this by having the beast as a primal animal with no sapience. The kids finding out at the last second that they're too spicy for it, a tense standoff, and Clark is allowed to defend his sister in a moment of triumph, finally accepting her. That is how you do a proper climax. Plus, it's done in a more human way, as we all learn the monster wasn't a threat at all. And then it blows up. Is it really dead this time? He slimed me. I think he's still alive. And that's that. Kids win. They escape RE7 and explain the plot for us, how it was allergic, which was cleverly foreshadowed earlier with Clark constantly crying about his allergies, which the monster also had. But more importantly, they both learned to love, finally embracing the other as true family. I guess we make a pretty good team, sister. I guess we do, brother. Get the camera, Jake! I can't! I'm paralyzed by the cuteness! That's such a sweet ending, which makes these two so precious and charming. But when everything's coming up Millhouse, we get our twist ending. The kids find a hidden message on the old coot's letter, explaining that they didn't actually lock them in the house to keep them in, but to keep other monsters out. You see, Erdnot Swamp wasn't the only monster in these woods, as there's numerous creatures out and about haunting at night, seeking food. And of course, the kids get totally lost in ghoul turf, just as the fastest night ever falls. Hurry, SpongeBob! I think it's getting dark. Wow, what a dark ending. Except for one tiny problem. If the swamp monster was allergic to humans to the point of blowing up, then that means none of the monsters can hurt them because they're all allergic.
No! Won't lie, this is the sole issue I have with this episode. The twist sucks. After finding out that the swamp monster is allergic to humans, this implies that none of the creatures can eat them either. Meaning that this dark turn where the kids are lost in monster territory poses no danger, because as far as we know, this entire species can't eat them or even touch them. Stein never made it clear if just the main monster had this weakness or all do. So it does drain some tension in this hour out of the frying pan and into the fire finale. Sorry, Goose fans, but just like the Haunted Mask 1, this twist is ruined by not being scary due to poor planning. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the only bad part I have to complain about because this episode absolutely killed it. Oh my, oh my. How to Kill a Monster is just as awesome as I remember and holds up strongly as a delightful Goosebumps fable. It truly astounds me how nobody praises this episode more or even talks about the Swamp Monster on the same platform as Slappy or Dr. Dr. Brewer, because this was a spicy dish. How to Kill a Monster may seem like the usual Stein formula of kids versus monster, but the show staff did a grand job improving this plot and adding some incredible traits to make it more fun and memorable than the source material. The kids are super entertaining and undergo a rather adorable arc of learning to accept their newfound step-sibling while forced to confront a nightmare. The comedy moments are genuinely funny. The atmosphere in this is pure perfection. The spooky haunted house is quite amusing. The conflict is easily terrifying. The combat against the monster never fails at intensity. The narrative's much tighter. All the best moments from the book are delivered flawlessly. The minor changes helped the story overall. And naturally, the monster is a grisly abomination. That fully pays off as both a fun and unsettling menace. Ah! The Swamp Demon's presence is so intimidating that he makes this almost a PG Resident Evil nemesis. This killer croc proved to be epic enough that he even returned in the Goosebumps movie. While I've critiqued the easy fails of Goosebumps, the entire team was clearly on their A-game in this one. How to Kill a Monster is an old-fashioned southern gothic horror fable. With a kick-ass monster, an eerie sense of impending doom, and a wholesome fire-forged friendship in the making. The entire episode feels like a grim mix between Home Alone and RE7, stirring up one excellent pot of gumbo for us horror fans. While yes, there are some things the book did better and the show could have tweaked, How to Kill a Monster overall is not a bad episode in the slightest, and the series' interpretation of the ghoul is so awesome on its own. The conflict of kids being locked inside a dilapidated labyrinth with a feral predator is solid horror gold, and this outdid the novel's description greatly. Much like Perfect School and The Haunted Mask 2, the adaptation surpasses the book's feats and turned a decent story into platinum epicness. This is the normal standard of how awesome Goosebumps could be. I highly recommend watching this tale, because because you can't have a bad time or fail to be even the tiniest percent scared by the darkness shrouded in this swamp. While I do take disappointment in the lame twist ending, the rest of the episode attached to it is competently baked like an alluring plate of monster toxin. So, I reward this fable a gold skull. It came darn close to a perfect score. But like I said, the weak twist did clip it. I had this issue with the book, and sadly it was copied for the movie. Nevertheless, this is a phenomenal must-watch story that truly stirs the pot for monster B-movies. Kids will totally enjoy it for the critter alone and the snippy humor, but adults might 
might get into it as well, for the southern gothic atmosphere and campy fun. How to Kill a Monster is a delicious treat, hidden among good horror that you'll really crave to hunt. I'm your host, Catastrophe, and- <laughs> And I got another legendary type to catch. Later, Gators. Killed him for sure.